Welcome everyone. My name is Chelsea Spencer. I am the director on the League One Ontario Board of Directors, uh, owner and founder of Empower Athletics and Empower Football. On behalf of Ontario Soccer, I am pleased to return as your host for today's eighth edition of Play On eLearning Series presented by Respect in Sport. Ontario Soccer launched the series back in March 10th with the goal to educate energize and inspire all of you to pitch in and play on as we col uh, collaborate in preparing for a safe return to play for the 2021 outdoor season. Achieving even more than this, the series has brought us closer together and instilled a renewed sense of community and optimism. For that, we extend our deepest gratitude to our friends at Respect in Sport who have been by our side the beginning uh, to make all of this learning and engagement possible. Now, I am proud to introduce to you a leader in our soccer community, Paul Martin, an expert and passionate advocate on diversity, whom I'm fortunate enough to serve alongside on the Ontario Soccer Diversity Advisory Subcommittee. Paul, an adjunct professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Studies um, at Centennial College, where he is also an active member of the Anti-Black Racism Task Force, will shine a spotlight on challenges and responsibilities for us as leaders in fostering diversity and combating racism in soccer. He will take the audience on a journey from understanding the roots of historical racism and discrimination via an overview of diversity and inclusion to where we are today at a cultural tipping point. Paul will focus on the power of true diversity in sport to bring about change and to ensure that all of our work and play environments um, are psychologically safe and genuinely inclusive. Paul, welcome again and over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Welcome everybody and thank you for being here today. This is a, an honor and it's a pleasure. Um, I am I'm really um, pleased to be here today to be able to discuss this with you. This is the first, uh, I'm hoping of many conversations that we will be having uh, within our community of soccer uh, going forward. So let me just take the time here to set up my screen and share my presentation with, with everybody here today. One quick second. Okay, so let's start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, which is so important. Um, this has been an interesting discussion around uh, the, the around how we we acknowledge our past. We acknowledge our we, that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas and Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize that enduring presence of the First Nations people, the Métis, and also the Inuit. We, as a group and organization, today acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us. We recognize that it was never meant to be owned. We recognize further that most of the land that was entrusted to the indigenous people was in some cases shared by choice. However, all too often some of it was taken by force. We recognize this historical ongoing colonialism that has led to the present day situation where land acknowledgements are now offered in place of land. We express our deepest gratitude to the indigenous people and pledge our honor and our dignity as well as our divinity to ultimately connect us all as we go forward in this great land that we call Canada. So today we're going to start with an introduction and a history of uh, the ideologies and policies that govern, um, you know, us as a society. And we're going to have the the difficult conversation up front around where we are today, which is obviously uh, over 400 years of a system that has come into place and practice, and it's broken. And it's broken because it was constructed in such a way that it presents challenges in order for us to either, uh, you know, reform it, revolutionize it, or change it. So we first start off by looking at this idea of governance. Governance is the way in which policies and practices are rooted in our institutions and reinforce hidden beliefs and attitudes, ideologies and prejudices, stereotypes, and also discrimination. These are usually targeted against marginalized people. And what it ends up present, uh, presenting itself as is giving advantages to those who are part of the dominant class, right? So this idea of governance and government is a broader concept that actually refers to the structures and systems in society and these practices of our organizations, institutions, and how they actually um, uh, guide us. So racism as an institution works by actually denying access and opportunities to people from specific communities through the aforementioned systems. It often takes place through ideological beliefs and personal behavior patterns. Those patterns exist specifically as ethnocentrism, liking individuals or wanting to be around individuals just like yourself. We all have it, it's part of human nature. Favoritism, 
we like certain people and we don't like other people. That's just natural. And that favoritism also shows its head in uh, who we bring around us. Nepotism, which is family members, cronyism, sexism, ableism, right? This idea that if you're not able-bodied, that you're not um, uh, having the skill sets, knowledge, and ability to, to, to get certain things done. That becomes institutionalized through our policies and practices. Systemic oppression occurs when an institution or a set of institutions works together to create and maintain inequality. This can be unintentional and doesn't necessarily mean that doesn't necessarily mean that <clears throat> people within the organization are racist in and of themselves. However, they benefit from the actions uh, by getting privilege that is now denied to others. It works by denying those others access and opportunity. It often results in doing things the way that they've always been done and are continuing to be done. So without the consideration of the impact of what doing things the way they've always been done has on other groups and also groups uh, who have various intersectionalities. So let's take, take a quick look at race as a social construct. So if we, we have this idea as what's normal. What's normal in society is this idea of whiteness. From a historical perspective, race is not something that exists in terms of scientific uh, theory or any kind of science. It's a sociological construct which does not exist. There's only one race and that race is the human race. In terms of classification of race, we have to look back to the beginning of where was race created or when was it created. It was actually created first in 19, sorry, in 1676 during Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia when the, the early days of the slave trade to deny the indentured servants their rights. It was through the practices of policies and governance that they were de denied access by uh, any opportunity through law. So for example, we had people who were indentured. If you're an indentured slave, which means that you worked off your slavery. Uh, we had various forms of slavery in the world at the time, but we had people who were enslaved even from uh, within the right white race. You could work that off by um, giving service back to the owner who had um, money or power or land, or whatever have you. What they found though was people were then starting to go free and be able to then um, set up their own shop and create their own ways of uh, existing. And those who were in power said, we don't want that. We want to be able to continue to have control. So they started to legislate and put uh, laws in place, but in putting those laws in place, we had to then consider, well, wait a minute, who's here going to get benefit? We don't have a label for who's going to benefit. That label of white people was then created, black people, uh, Indian people, brown people, so on and so forth. So the term white created this separation of people to give advantage to one group and then to deny others the ability. So for example, you couldn't own land. Well, why? Because you were a black person or because you're indigenous. It had nothing to do with the fact of your meritocracy or hard work. Uh, so that was adopted as a standard as to what could be owned and what couldn't. We even have a term called Caucasian, which was adopted from the mid uh, 1700s as well, and meant to be beautiful or dominant in society. Uh, here's some uh, links and references that we can look at later to do some historical research around these terms and what they mean. So in understanding whiteness in this idea of birth of a nation, here's a really great book that I suggest that you guys uh, take a look at and read if, if, you, uh, if you can. Um, this uh, book and study from the author looks at race in America and also by way of extension Canada and explores uh, the moment in time when white people as a separate distinct group of humanity were invented through legislation and laws. So that's what most people miss in general in social constructs that it wasn't done by accident, it was done on purpose and the laws were created to benefit certain people and not benefit others. And those practices continue on to today where we see the exact same behavior by um, uh, we have certain people being denied access. So this book provides a really good examination of the underlying reasons as to why it was created and uh, goes on to explain that it was about labor and about um, capital and it served the interests of those who were in power which was the ruling elite. So what is whiteness? Whiteness is a dominant culture space that uh, gives you advantage and gain. So research uh, shows us that when we talk about race we automatically start thinking about blackness but that's not where the problem really lies or where our answers are. The answer is in looking first at our collective overall ideologies, but also including whiteness. If we don't know the history of whiteness and are ignorant to what has happened and how even whiteness has changed over the years, then how can we begin to uh, bring about changes? So racism is based on this concept of whiteness as a powerful uh, enforced power that uh, uses violence at, at times as well to be able to maintain that power. So it's constantly shifting and changing by who is entitled and who is not. As part of the studies that we do in, in Centennial, we also start to look at um, gender and we also look at uh, the wealth gap as to who's becoming more wealthy 
And this is all about the ruling elite class who just happened to be white at the time. But now we're seeing oppression and violence and other uh, individuals and races because again, it's the same power. So uh, this definition and information is from the Alberta Civil Liberties uh, Research Center. And you can have a look at the, uh, the, the link here to find further information about the work they're doing uh, in that center there as well. So when we talk about whiteness, we have to then address certain terms. This is just for um, reflection and understanding. We can go further in future as we talk about it. Often when we talk about these terms, people will, will, will get offended because they don't understand or they, they feel challenged by it. So whiteness again is the state of the normal and of dominance and of power and of privilege. So what is white privilege? This unearned power advantage that you get. And when we discuss it, oftentimes these other terms that are documented here around whiteness show their behavior. Typically people will get upset. Why do they get upset? Because they don't have an understanding. They feel attacked. But these are some terms that explain what's going on. White fragility as to why they're having such a hard time to discuss racism being in a dominant position of power. White fears, which is a loss of culture, identity, history, loss of the position of dominance. Uh, white terrors, misunderstanding, feeling hurt in terms of realizing the privilege that's been given. White guilt, feeling um, you know, guilty over past atrocities and behavior that uh, is current towards the uh, behavioral patterns we see today in society. It's not about anybody's fault. It's about what was because it took 400 years to build this system. And now we have this imbalance that we have to address. So there are typical behaviors that we see that people go through when they're addressing this honestly. What we need is people to have the honest conversations and difficult conversations in the room so that we can move forward as a society. This idea of oppression. Well, oppression works in different ways to different groups. If we look at sexism, the idea of prejudice and discrimination on one's sex and ability, we see that uh, in, in sports all the time. In sport, women and girls are very much underrepresented. If we look at many levels, we don't see what is, uh, what is appropriate. So we have to take a very concerted effort to try and increase representation across our sport. We've obviously had years of, of, of patriarchy that have caused uh, this, this challenge. So now we have to start looking at how do we change it in all aspects in terms of representation. So the Canadian Women in Sports uh, Foundation states that there's a lack of media coverage and underrepresentation in female leaders. There's a lack of pay equity, as we saw in the United States, whereby we had the United States uh, women's soccer team addressing this challenge of pay equity. Also ne negative stereotyping and a lot of challenges that we face in sports that we see women um, go through. So it's really important for us to start to look at uh, what challenges um, women are, uh, and girls have in the sport and also take a further look at discrimination from an intersectional lens. Well, what is intersectionality? We'll get into that a little bit later, but it means that it's just basically all of your differences that make up who you are as a person. Um, so when we address this and we try to address gender um, as, as, as a challenge and we, we wanna put things in place, oftentimes the things we put in place end up harming because we don't take into consideration intersectionality. And for example, we find that in a lot of uh, gender-based um, studies and a lot of gender-based movements, it has ended up that white women have benefited and women of color have not. So we have to make a concerted effort to consider all intersectionality of gender in order to make sure that all are benefiting. Ableism, this the discrimination of social prejudice against people who have disabilities. This perceived idea of those who are disabled, uh, you know, don't have a, a right to be able to, to enjoy the same things that we do. And this comes from a dominant class mentality, right? So ableism characterizes people who are defined by their disabilities and they are often listed as being inferior or not abled. So we are coining a new term. As we move forward in this idea of diversity, we're looking at language, which is very important. And the new term that we're seeing now is diversability. It is your ability, which is diverse, not focusing on the negative aspects of the word of what you cannot do in terms of disability, but on the uh, aspect of what we are able to do. Many of us as leaders in sports and soccer um, in our positions often don't consider all these various aspects. We're you know, most times really just worried about the actual product on the field, but there's so much more that goes into it that we have to look at in order for us to be well-rounded. Whether we coach teams or uh, are participating with teams that have diverse ability or have females or not, it is up to us to be well-rounded as people who are administrators, coaches, officials, uh, and so forth, to be able to look at this education and be more aware of, of the different aspects of our overall society. We are now at a time where we're seeing much more representation from our LGBTQ uh, brothers and sisters, whereby we now have a person on our national team, a uh, world-class soccer player in Quinn, who recently came out last year as a transgender um, person in September of 2020. 
we know as a society and culture will have to create safe spaces and be inclusion inclusionary for all athletes. More participants will identify and come out as we now treat them uh, and how we treat them as society will send a message. It's very vital for us to create safe spaces uh, within soccer administration, within education and training, so we know how to properly address these concerns as we come forward. There's a really great resource here from uh, the Canadian Centre for, um, for Sport here that you guys can look up, which talks about creating inclusive safe spaces uh, for uh, transgender athletes. This idea of gender bias and discrimination, we often don't see. We just think that uh, maybe uh, that person is, is complaining or making noise or what's the issue here? Well, the issue is when we start to look deeper uh, that historically there has been discrimination against women and against women of color. Let's just take a quick look here at the case of Castor Semenya, who uh, has been scrutinized continually and faced challenges for the past decade. Um, her latest challenge is now in court um, with, with the IOC and the Olympic Committee. Um, but we look at someone like Michael Phelps, who also has very uh, the same sorts of genetic differences, whereby he has uh, a certain a bigger wingspan, certain uh, genetic uh, disposition about his lactic acid, he's able to swim much better and has won all these records. Yet we don't punish or have negative uh, association. We actually celebrate Michael Phelps, but yet we don't celebrate Castro Semenya. So we have to start taking a look at what's the difference. The difference here is a heteronormative dominant white male ideology over a minoritized black woman. So we have to stop and ask, well, where is the fairness and where's the justice and how we're treating this and treating others who will have the same a sense as we go forward in, in, in our uh, sport, um, our sport governance and also our sport uh, oversight. This idea of racism, or as we're all seeing now in society, is, is prevalent. It's not just to one or two groups. We're seeing racism uh, across the board. We're seeing racism on the rise now. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't have to get into detail about uh, George Floyd, which we've all seen, and also about anti-Asian hate around the pandemic. The pandemic we've all faced has brought challenges to all of us, but it's also exacerbated what's already underlying uh, in our society, which is this, this predominant racism and prejudice that we see against people um, because of their membership of a particular group. Uh, the, just most recently, the English FA announced that they're going to have a social media boycott and banning because of the amount of uh, um, hate we're seeing and racism we're seeing right now on social media because people are at home and they have a lot more time to spend on social media. So we're seeing a, a huge rise in these incidences. So this is just really recent. Uh, that they've come up with this statement that they're going to be making a stand and taking a stand against racism. These are some things that we have to start thinking about as a soccer landscape, as a society, starting individually with us as individual people, and how we communicate in terms of our social media, going one step further into our uh, teams and our clubs, how we communicate with our youth, now is a great time to engage in other uh, conversation because there's only so many Zoom, uh, sorry, Zoom trainings you can do uh, right now where before uh, players start to get disengaged. If we can engage our players uh, at, at different levels in terms of where they're at and meet them around some of these social discussions, it gives us the opportunity to really shift the paradigm. We have this specific uh, challenge on racism, which is anti-Black racism specifically. Uh, Anti-black racism is defined as the policies and practices rooted in Canadian institutions. We talked about it prior in the, the, the foundation that these institutions were set up not to benefit other people, specifically people of, of the black race as a so-called, um, because of the fact that they were used again at that time as slaves and they did not want them to rise up from a socioeconomic standpoint. So we see all kinds of violence throughout history whereby um, this specific anti-black racism has emerged and it's found its way into our uh, all of our systems uh, in terms of our governance and government, um, policing, healthcare, um, and, and, um, justice, education, all these areas. So we have to seek to highlight this unique nature of systemic racism, um, specifically within Canada and also all over the world. Uh, during George Floyd, we saw the whole world unite and protest. It wasn't just one or two people or black people alone. It was the whole world standing up saying that they, they really abhor what's happening. And for those that want some more further study on anti-black racism, there's a, a number of links here. The Canadian government has made statements on it. The Ontario government has made sta statements on it. The city of Toronto, many other cities too are now coming on board and making statements and enacting protocols to address this concern. Since George Floyd, we've seen an awakening. Out of this problem, we have looked at this idea of anti-black racism, specifically in the one area of police enforcement. On the day of uh, the uh, arraignment and uh, and the trial of, uh, of the gentleman who shot George Floyd, we all were elated and celebrated. 
And some of us vicariously went through that trauma once again. But yet on that same day, we had continued shootings. There was five to six shootings of people within one week. Whether shootings be justified or not, it's just a continued loss of human life. So we have to take different approaches and think about how we go about addressing these, these uh, challenges and problems. There has been a number of research studies conducted over the past year that highlight the problems that we see in society and how they continue to permeate in so many different areas. There is a, a one study called Unfunded that how black not-for-profit organizations within Canada are funded to the tune of 0.017%. So what does that mean? That means that if I have a not-for-profit soccer club and my club is black and your club is white or your club is brown or whatever have you, the white club will be funded by giving that full dollar. The black club will be given 0.17 cents. So you can see how drastic the challenges are even in terms of uh, with that one example I gave. And this is all documented uh, in terms of the studies. We have to have these studies so that we can actually see exactly what's happening. And we're, we're, we're having studies across all parts of the sector, and we're now looking at uh, how we can make changes. So how do we go about making the changes and looking at these issues? This is something that I teach at Centennial College as part of the overall course, it's called social analysis. There are a number of frameworks that we can look at to, to, to try to analyze and find out where is the problem. This is actually part of the course that every single student that has to take this has to go through this process at Centennial College. So we're talking, you know, the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, I personally have taught uh, each semester. I'm teaching about close to uh, 200 students. And over the years I've been doing this, so I've seen close to about 2000 students who have gone through this process. It's a really good process to sit down and look at how do we examine what a social problem is, right? And, and there's a framework that allows us to break down the issues into subparts. We have to ask questions. And some of those questions are, how is this issue created? How is it also maintained, right? What constitutes a problem? And how might we now go about changing that problem to some of the factors that we're looking at? What is the social analysis and how do we apply it, right? What are the social structures that exist within society that keep the problem existing? So these are some questions you can ask, but uh, it gets a little bit more detailed when we look at a framework model. This is one model called the iceberg model. And I'll quickly draw your attention to kind of the structure of it so you can see how we uh, address these concerns. By and large, society operates in this area of just events. What's the personal individual act or event that we see? We see a police shooting, for example, and we say, well, oh, it's just you know that one off case. So we try to separate it and we don't look at it as part of the bigger whole until we start to see patterns and trends. We see that there's sexism within uh, sport in the way uh, we see lack of safeguarding towards women and girls. And we say, well, it's just the way he talks or the way the behavior of that person is or has been. Uh, chalk it up to the good old boys club, so to speak. Uh, but these are behaviors and language that are not appropriate, need to be addressed. And we're starting to see that there's a lot of patterns, but beneath that there's an underlying structure that influences uh, that particular um, uh, happening. And then further to that, there's an actual mental model, how we see things, how we think about things. So we have to go through this process and look at it in terms of asking ourselves questions and then in forming a report, we will get the idea as to what is actually happening and then what we can do about changing it. Here's another example that we use at, at the college. It's called the triangle model, and it goes into a little more detail. As you can see, the issue is in the center here, what the social problem is. And then at the top, we have the individual acts, what people see. And often, most of us, we just os oscillate and operate within this area. Um, it's the tip of the iceberg, rather than you know going down into, into the deep part of it. As we know, as they say within an iceberg, all you see is 10%, which sits above the surface. The real issue and challenge is the 90% below. So in this same kind of idea of the iceberg model, or even in this triangle model, what are the point, the point, the parts that sit below? The parts that sit below are the ideologies, which is how you think. What is your idea? Your ideas around patriarchy, around white supremacy, classism, capitalism, heterosexism, ableism, and then what are structures that back that up? These actual structures in society actually, uh, you know, back up these ideologies, even though we know that they're constructed to benefit only the dominant class. So this is an analysis that the students use to look at the issue. We could take this uh, model and we can apply it to soccer and look at parts of soccer intersectionally, uh, whether it be gender, whether it be ableism, whether it be uh, racial, and we would you know, be able to try and really break down some of the challenges and problems that we see. Well, how do we go forward and make changes? Well, we have to look at this concept called diversity. But within diversity, we have to also look at two parts of identity. The first part of identity is what our makeup is. Our social identity is made up of various parts of who we are and how we belong to various social groups, our race, our gender, our religion, our social class. But further to that, our intersectionality looks at um, this idea that we are made up of many parts. and We're not one whole existing dominant group. 
so this idea back to the beginning of dominance was and, and normal was just being a white person, whereas we're not even taking any intersectionality in, into um, into consideration when we look at that. Uh, within that category itself, we have differences of, of even a person. We could have a white female who is also a, um, a transgender person who's also young. So we're, we're now looking at three aspects of that person's uh, uh, intersectionality and identity. The term was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a black uh, social uh, sociologist. And why she coined the phrase, because she looked at it as a black woman, she faced a number of intersections she can be discriminated against because you're black, because you could be transgender, because you're a woman, because you're young, and because maybe you have a, you know, a diverse ability as well. So all these parts make up part of who you are, uh, your citizenship, your religion, your family status. You can be discriminated against in all these various ways, but these are the ways that make up who we are as a person. Here's a really good article um, and uh, uh, document on uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and interviewed her talking about this idea of intersectionality. So the way forward is for us to do what? Is to embrace diversity. Well, why? Why is diversity important? It's important for a number of reasons. It allows a person to view the issues and the problems from multiple standpoints. It draws on different experiences and perspectives and knowledge. Rather than viewing the world as a single focus lens, a person is able to expand their view and consider multiple options. Diversity moves people beyond this idea of ethnocentrism and egocentric points of view and allows them to learn about other people's experiences, backgrounds, and learns, and you're able to learn more about yourself. Sport is one of the most diverse environments that is really can be inclusive if we really include different cultures and racial backgrounds. Uh, and at the start of every semester, I do an experiment with all my students whereby I have them say where they're from, what part of the world, and uh, have them just tell us something that is unique about where they're from. Uh, every semester, I have no less than 20 different countries represented in my classes every single uh, every single semester, every single, every single year. So I'm able to learn a lot personally just about the differences in cultures all over the world by just interacting with people who are in my sphere, in my sphere of, uh, of uh, uh, relationships. So it's really something that we should be thinking about, embracing diversity. Start to talk to individuals who don't look like you. Start to look, look to uh, find out about things that you normally wouldn't find out about because that would really help you have a better understanding. So why is diversity important? Because we know that diversity equals success and equals competitive advantages. We optimize human resource values. We promote innovative thinking and creative problem solving. We have improved, improved employee retention and behavior. We have greater competitive market dominance. There was a recent study just done um, uh, this year where they uh, surveyed over 1,800 professionals and, did four, and looked at 40 case studies on diversity in the workplace. And specifically, the firms with workplace diversity, whereby they had more than 45%, had a huge market growth year after year. Likewise, diversity in the workplace correlated to a 70% higher chance of capturing new competitive markets because of what that company had in terms of its, uh, its makeup. So diversity is really important that we need to be looking at it. From a soccer perspective, it's important because we are living in a country that's going to become more and more multicultural. As Canada embraces multiculturalism, and they have since the 70s, we were one of the first countries in the world to have an actual multicultural act. It took 18 years to enact that uh, act into law, but that is now part of the framework of who we are and why we're so attractive to many places all across the world. Um, Canada also, uh, as a uh, population growth, we do not replace ourselves. Our family sizes are usually 1.2 children to two children. That does not replace you. You need to have three children, more than what you have, in order to continue your culture, your race, your 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 um, own um, gender, and sorry, your own culture, but we're not doing that. So as a country to continue to grow, we have to bring in immigration, and a lot of the immigration is very multicultural. So we, as uh, people in various communities, no matter how far we are, whether we're far north as uh, as Thunder Bay or as uh, south as Niagara or east or west, we are seeing immigration and we're seeing a change. So for us to be able to embrace the future, we have to start to look at diversity and take on a different lens. But in doing so, we have to really think, why does diversity fail? At some point, people will say, well, why bother do diversity? Because it doesn't really help us at all whatsoever. Harvard Business Review did a really good study across the last 20 years in, in 2016, looking at what the challenges were for diversity. And it goes back to, again, understanding historical significance and context. Diversity was never created in the first place to serve people. It wasn't, serve, it wasn't to serve the benefit of making the workplace more inclusive. It was created to serve firms who were getting a lot of lawsuits. And the whole idea was they wanted to reduce the amount of bias and, and uh, through testing, through performance rating, to limit uh, you know, the challenges they were facing as organizations. But all these tools were designed to preempt the lawsuits and were to police 
people or managers through their actions. It wasn't really made to, to have the workplace be inclusive, right? So our goal is, is, is for diversity, but we have to work through diversity and move into what's called human capital. From an HR perspective, this idea of human diversity is really important. You know, this idea of equity on an equity scale of one to five for your corporation or your organization, where do you sit? And this is all about looking at tools to say, where are we today and how do we move forward into, into different, uh, different um, constructs and, and able to move forward to, to make some change in terms of our numbers. This is a book written by uh, uh, Trevor Wilson. He's one of the um, foremost uh, leading experts on diversity in Canada. Uh, one of the pioneers just happens to be my cousin <laughs> so a little bit of self-promotion for trevor but um uh, his uh, theory uh, and on human equity and diversity advantage has been proven through case studies or by companies have seen major major increases by looking at this idea of what are the intersectional aspects of your employees and where can they contribute and feel a sense of belonging our ultimate goal in diversity is not just to have diverse or to have inclusion it's belonging we don't want labels to say you're a you know an lgbtq person or a woman or a black person we just want to really belong but how can you belong when those organizations are ethnocentric nepotistic and you know they're not open and welcome to change so we're now at the point in time whereby we have a huge responsibility and also a huge ability to make change through sport because sport is so powerful that it allows us to build teams and build cultures and experience things that we normally would not experience. Uh, people who play sports often are looked at more favorably in terms of the hiring market as well because they've had experiences that others may not have had in terms of uh, life skills and also employability skills. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire us. It has the power to unite people in a way that little us does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than God in any Racial barrier. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. Nelson Mandela gave that speech just before uh, a World World Cup games that were happening in in South Africa, whereby black players were not allowed to be on the team. Um, now we look forward, and what are we seeing? We're seeing change happening in South Africa, right? So we have to believe in this change that we as individuals can make a difference in sport because sport does have that power innate and we are all part of this beautiful game. So how do we move forward? This is a continuum that I've broken down into simple parts to explain how we can go forward by assessing first where we're at and then how we go forward in terms of making changes. There's this idea that um, uh, in order to make change, we have to have a knowledge and we have to have all this uh, information before us. We don't have to have that. We just have to start to uh, be able to understand where we're at and move from that point to the next point. So really simply, uh, some of us are in this stage of introduction and acknowledgement. We're just now starting to understand uh, where we're at in terms of diversity, and we wanna you know, be an ally, and we wanna move forward. Um, some of us are in the phase where we're moving now into education development. We're all individually responsible for the different parts of this continuum, and we continue to travel through this continuum over and over again. As we learn about one area, um, we're able to then add that to our knowledge base, come back around and, and continue to look at different aspects of diversity. Once we move from education and development, many of us will then move into implementation and action. Um, many of us, though, are already at this stage and want action now. Well, how do we get others to move when they're just in the beginning of the introduction and the acknowledgement phase? We have to work together to move along and we have to recognize that us as a community and organizations and individuals will be at different stages at different points in time. We have to exhibit uh, patience, but also at the same time, we have to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable towards a movement of change. And that accountability has to be documented so we know where the gaps are. That's the whole purpose of uh, having data collection so we can know where we're at. So as we go through these different parts and phases, we look at uh, what our needs are as an organization, also individually, and hopefully we can continue to move through this reflective uh, uh, continuum whereby we'll look at where we're at on a continual basis and, and look to make change. So Ontario soccer, where are we at? Ontario soccer, the challenge of diversity has been 
uh, a conversation that has been had in many a locker room, soccer field community for a very long time. Um, we're pleased to see that within this last year, uh, many of us came together as part of a diversity subcommittee and were able to make recommendations and change. When I sat down individually and told many people to join this committee, the, the overall um, general attitude is we're never going to see change. Why bother? We're not going to participate in, in this whole exercise. And it was a really meaningful exercise for me personally. I can't speak for anybody else on, on anybody else's behalf, but it was rewarding for me to just see us coming together as a community and addressing our concerns. We were able to break into subgroups. Uh, I think there was uh, six to eight subgroups where we, we looked at each aspect of why we, uh, why we have the challenges we have, where we're at, and how we're going to go and move forward. Uh, from that committee came a number of recommendations, which even in discussion amongst the group, we weren't sure that the board was going to adopt those recommendations. But we have to give uh, 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 kudos to the board for um, taking all of our recommendations under advisement and, and, and passing um, uh, those recommendations and uh, adopting them. So here's the report here. You guys can look at it and see that it's been put up by Ontario Soccer as to what the, the board uh, will be looking to do upon implementing the uh, subcommittee's um, uh, recommendations. And some of the recommendations are uh, making the committee a standing committee, um, having recognition, committing towards working towards these working groups, new operational committees, uh, nomination standing committee, further strategies, transparency, and also the, the hiring of a, a diversity officer, which just happened uh, this week. Okay, So we know that Ontario as a body is moving forward towards change. And you know who is Ontario soccer? It's us. At the end of the day, it's the players, it's the parents, it's the administrators, it's the officials, it's the board members, it's the volunteers, it's all of us. And we have to play a part in that change. It's it's easy to sit on the sidelines and point our finger and say it's never going to change. Um, I'd rather be part of the action of making the change. And I implore you all and, and, and encourage you all to be a part of that change as well. It may not always go the way we want it to, but we got to start somewhere, right? So what are some recommendations that we can look to do in our communities, uh, in, in our overall programs? I presented this exact same kind of um, uh, idea to the subcommittee. I also um, presented some some similar recommendations as, as a number of the um, uh, committees I'm on for Centennial College. We talked about short term, long term, midterm gains, and a lot. We're finding a lot of the the recommendations are quite similar. Um, I also did a uh, SWOT analysis, which was the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, uh, specifically on anti-black racism towards Canada soccer. So we're we're, we're looking to move ahead. Um, I'm happy to say that Ontario soccer has moved a little bit faster in terms of implementing some of these things through the subcommittee and diversity committee that was created. Um, I'm hoping that we can see the same at Canada soccer and by extension further, I'm hoping to see the same thing in our districts and also in our clubs. And that's up to you guys. It's not up to me. It's not up to our, our subcommittee. It's up to all of us as a community, as the, the wider landscape. And now is the time because we, we have a little more time in our hands. Typically where we would be on the soccer field or out in the evenings, um, you know, and, and not really available. Now we have some time to think and to work towards implementing change within our communities. It's not going to happen overnight because we're trying to address 400 years of, of, of challenges and problems. But if we can even, you know, um, address some of these things, we're going to go a lot further than where we are today. So some recommendations can be making a public statement, not only on issues of racism, but issues of sexism, issues uh, of, of gender violence, issues of um, treatment to to very um, various minority communities. We saw a lot of anti-Asian hate around the pandemic. We can be supporting each other uh, for what's right and getting behind these different uh, actions. But it's one thing to make statements and have no support behind it. We have to have the support behind it. We need to be able to create diverse and inclusive uh, um, environments by creating an action plan. This way we hold, we hold ourselves accountable. Doesn't matter how much you, you think you can get done or needs to be done, just even doing a few things within your, your soccer club or your team, even down to your individual teams, we can uh, put together some sort of action plan. What do we do if these situations come up rather than sleeping under the rug? So if you have players on your team that are, you know, you're hearing about are coming to you and talking about, um, you know, the toxic language that we often see within sports or about racism. We've had a number of uh, schools, universities, college and what, uh, colleges and whatnot, uh, we're seeing over this last year come forward with, talking about the challenges they face, right? We're seeing a lot of uh, gender issues too as well in terms of people speaking up and standing for what's right and what's what's uh, what, what's proper. So we have to look to acknowledge and celebrate the diversity and also be inclusive within our communities. Far too often, we're often only um, marketing and talking about the norm, the dominant part of our clubs, 
rather than looking at the whole intersectional part of our clubs and looking at all aspects and making sure that as a grassroots club make up the large percentage of our population, we need to start talking more about those things and making sure that we're, we're truly inclusive, right? Um, ensure the representation in your, in your communication. Is it woven into the fabric of your organization? If you look at this presentation here, as I went through, if you look at all the imagery, you can see that I make sure to have uh, images that are well balanced. When I worked at Centennial College for five years as a sports and information marketing officer, I could not have put out any kind of imagery unless I sat down and took the time to make sure that it was inclusive and representative. Um, and, and that was a big part of the job that I had to do. And I was able to set a lot of the initial policies and standards when the school didn't have any at the time. Um, so it's really important to start to look at how we're we're communicating and far too often we just communicate in the norm, right? So we must also engage in education and learning as an ongoing issue for diversity. Um, it's a great start today. The fact that you're here and you're actually hearing me and you're on this call and we as a collective community have taken the steps to to have this kind of talk is, is, is an excellent first step. So midterm uh, goals that we can all look to is by putting together some diversity uh, uh, advisory committees. It doesn't have to be whereby people are meeting every single week, every single month. I think we exacerbate the situation. If we had diversity committees built within our soccer clubs as part of our boards as subcommittees, we can meet once and twice a year. Um, it's not so much to ask, and I don't think that it's a challenge really to go out and find some people from different marginalized minority communities to be a part of your club and your organization by lending their voice to just giving you another perspective and point of view around diversity, right? Um, we have to employ a strategy of public recognition. So we have to look at the contributions made to sport by all, right? And making sure that we're actually uh, celebrating all the various holidays that are part of our community and extending um, you know, our overall reach to, to those communities. Because we do want to engage people from those various communities across the board because they're part of our community and also part of our soccer clubs and academies and institutions, right? We have to engage and work in partnership with communities. We have to create a, a diversity committee overall, I think, you know, as an overall bigger perspective in our districts and like I just mentioned in our clubs. Uh, we can look at holding town hall discussions whereby we will discuss uh, diversity in these kind of formats uh, within your own club. Uh, how many clubs have sat down and organizations have sat down and, and polled even the, their youth that are playing soccer and asked them to even talk about in a safe space some issues around gender and, and race and, and you know, um, ableism and, and these things, right? Uh, so having these conversations and getting feedback allows us all to learn, allows us all to grow. We have to also create a resource library. There's lots of definitions nowadays we're seeing and 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 con um, and list listing of information. Um, if you contact me or Ontario Soccer after, I can provide some some lists. I have a number of them, but these are things we can easily be adding to our website, adding to our communication, so that people can then look at these terms and look at these um, these topics for lifelong learning. For a longer term type of uh, over overall. Um, relationship, we could look at creating programs, specifically internship programs that target these groups specifically. Far too often we create these programs and we go back to the norm. We don't see uh, the intersectionality in these programs. We need to make sure that we're, we're inclusive and including all because if we don't provide the opportunities, people want mentorship and sponsorship. Those are the two biggest things that have come out. You don't need to be somebody of the same race, color, background, able bodied age to be able to provide, uh, you know, a sponsorship towards somebody. Um, you know, it's just really you being being present and, and being a resource to people. Um, we have to commit to data collection and research. Why do we need this data collection for? It's really important because it allows us to see where the gaps are. It informs us around how we'll make decisions going forward and also hold us accountable. If we look at re gender representation and racial representation across Ontario, we have like 21 districts with 20 to 30 clubs per district. You know, you do the math, that's easily upwards of four to 500 clubs and, uh, and academies and whatnot. And I don't have the statistics. I would love to have us collect us those statistics, but we have to start asking ourselves, how many people do we see in senior leadership that are representative of our community? Do we see females as technical directors and as executive directors and as heads of clubs? We don't. Do we see gender, I'm uh, sorry, do we see racialized people, um, you know, um, Asian and Southeast Asian and black people holding these positions? We don't. So by and large, out of those 500, again, I don't have the numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's below 50. And, you know, that's it's way below what it needs to be. The Canadian government has, has embarked on a new challenge that's going to be coming up for corporations called the 50-30 challenge, which means that their goal is to have 50% gender representation and 30% racialized representation within your organizations in the near future. This may even become law. If this is a law and, and, and there's consequences and you're not prepared, what's going to happen then to your organization? So now is the time for us to get prepared and start to look at uh, how we uh, uh, make the change in our society as our society is changing. 
And part of that goes back to our language and also frameworks around policy and government and, and governance. So we need to make sure that the language is, is inclusive and we're, we're making sure that we have ad adequate representation within our communities. Often we'll hear, well, I don't know where I can find somebody or I, I don't know where to go. If we just start to extending to communities and the communities feel like they're part of the overall solution rather than just being placated or rather than just being a token, then we're going to see a huge change happening in society. We're not saying that um, everywhere has great numbers of diversity because different cities across our great province and country have different representation, but we know it's changing. So the question is, is, is there adequate representation within your own community? So I'll leave you at that with this idea of how we can go forward making change. And hopefully we will see change over the next year when we get back out in the field, hopefully later this year and next year when we actually look up, we can see not having to have a data study Data and studies are there for accountability, but we would love to just see some diversity, for example, like the picture we see there. That's, you know, again, true diversity. We're seeing the different makeup of various individuals within our programming. So at that point, I will now take some questions and hear some feedback, and hopefully we can all engage in some meaningful discussion around this area of diversity. Paul, thank Paul, you, thank so, you much so much for such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. presentation. Um, we will turn over to the chat function, like I mentioned earlier, and um, take your, your questions if you have them as they come in. Just a friendly reminder, as the questions come in, um, depending on time, we may not get through all of them, um, but we will take them away and I'm sure Paul would be happy to answer them offline. Just wait for those questions to come through. Paul, it was so much great information. Very yeah. engaging. It's, it's a lot to unpack. And, you know, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's this right. It's not gonna happen uh, overnight. It's going to take some time. And yes, the presentation will be uh, available. I will make this available. There's also uh, a listing I have, which I didn't show, of resources where I have uh, some terms in and I also have a number of links that were in the presentation, but also at the end, some references. Some nice thank yous. That's great. I don't know why this chat function is on. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't figured out how to turn it off. My apologies. It's been dinging all, all to the presentation. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so we've got, let me just read through some of these. Yeah, so, um, George, this is Michael. Michael, um, thank you for your question. And this, this presentation will be available um, for all the participants so not to worry you'll get you'll get a copy for sure i don't know if this is something you can answer paul but um yolanda is asking if there's a specific training of if there are specific training links that ontario soccer has for its grassroots clubs for their coaches and maybe technical staff etc cetera, etc cetera. that's a great question um yolanda um, we're, we're just in the midst, as you've seen, the, the, the new committee has been formed. I'm pretty sure it's something we will be providing. I don't want to speak for the, the whole association, but I'm pretty sure we will be able to, to provide that training and resources. It's something, we, you know, I am uh, dedicated to and many others on the uh, subcommittee are also dedicated to. So we will see that coming out. We're just at the very beginning. The greatest part was having the initial conversation today to start that process. We will make a lot of that stuff available and we'll go from there together as a community. I feel we will we'll build uh, the necessary resources that we need to be able to address some of these concerns. Thanks, Paul. Um, Jeff has asked, and um, he's not sure necessarily how to word this, but if racism and bias has compounded over 100 plus years, how long does it take to break it down? Can we accelerate it? Or how do we accelerate it? That's a great question, Jeff. I mean, you know, like in anything, it, it's going to take time to, to, to change things. And it's also dependent upon the resistance that, uh, that you feel. Obviously, before this, many marginalized, racialized people, people who have faced, you know, these challenges have, have really um, been beside themselves and, and, and um, felt like change will not, is not going to happen. But <clears throat> now, excuse me, sorry, hang on. <laughs> sorry. Now we're seeing that um, uh, change is, is being accelerated because there's an awareness. So it all starts with awareness and education. If people don't know where their problems are and then people don't want to change, then obviously, you know, there's going to be resistance. So how we address the resistance is by starting the process. Uh, there's no easy answer. 
but it's a great question of how do we accelerate it? As you saw on the continuum, it starts first with education and understanding. And how we have the understanding is by first of all, listening to people around you that are not like you. We live in, an, and like I said, in a very ethnocentric world. It's not just Canada or North America or the Western world. We're, we're all very ethnocentric. The problem we have now is the world has changed. We've now become globalized. Uh, whereby you know people and resources and goods are moving to and fro and we're having to um to really deal with uh people that don't look like you right so people who don't have the same cultural background and and and, and uh, understanding and sense that you do so it really comes down to you spending the time uh, of learning and that's going to take some time it might take your whole life the goal is not for us to say that oh it's going to change tomorrow it's not our fingers it is to make it better for the next generation yes it's a slow process but at the same time we can um, we can move stuff forward. So now, Paul, I, I have a question, maybe just to comment on what you've just said. Um, you'd mentioned, you know, going, reaching out and speaking with people who don't look like you to understand different cultures, but there is a, a tactful way to do that. And maybe you can shed some light on how that might look. Maybe some examples of questions people can ask if they are looking to reach out to different communities or different people other than their own culture. It's a very good question. I give one example of, again, it's, it's the spaces and places where you're in. I mean, I'm in a position of power and authority as a professor. So I'm, you know, the, the, the students are forced to, to share that experience. But at the same time, we have to start to look for places whereby, um, you know, we, we can have that engagement. I mean, and as you know, it's sport, it's on the soccer field. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we don't even realize. It's right in front of us, you know, a tackle, you have a bad tackle, you know, you, you say sorry to that person, you pick them up and you talk to them. After the game, you talk to them, hey, you know, you had a great game. I did that for years as a coach. That's why I did a lot of my recruiting. After the games, I would always go to players and just have a conversation, not the poach, but just to say, hey, you know, um, you know, I really think that you did, you did this, you did that. And you'd be surprised at how far that went whereby I saw years later a player came back to me and not just one I'm talking numbers and numbers of players whether they be female or male have come back to me and say hey coach Paul do you remember me because of so and so you know hey coach Paul you know uh, I thank you for what you told me that one time we don't know the impact we're going to have on people um, so in the sport of soccer dealing with soccer itself we have great opportunities to to reach out and to find out about people we just don't really bother to you know are we willing to ask them about things about their life not just about what's on the pitch right uh, you know, hey, where you where you from? You know, I didn't know where you're from. Like I went into the bank the other day to open a bank account, and um, you know, the the gentleman who was at the bank was uh, was Pakistani, and it was for our, our new association called the Black Coaches Canada. And so he said, "What's this black stuff all about?" We had this conversation, and you know, it was interesting because we we're talking about blackness, but he got into this whole thing about how he sees himself. You know, is he black? Is he considered black in Canada? What does it mean to him? Because you know, for all purposes uh, of, of of the label in in this country, he would fit that mold, right? And so we had this really interesting discussion because, you know, he was able to just you know share with us his experiences and I was able to learn from another person uh, from another uh, another place. So, you know, we engage in this conversation. So we have to do that, engage in conversation and bring people around us who don't look like us. If we don't bring people around us who don't look like us, then how do you expect to then ever, you know, uh, get into the situations where you're going to start to engage in diversity? When I say don't look like you, that also means age and ability. My mm -hmm. kids always laugh at me because, you know, I'm getting older and I got a little more gray now, you know, yeah. but <laughs> around the young kids, right? And that's, that's just their language and words and they laugh at you. What are you talking about? How do you know that term, right? Right. <laughs> keeps you kind of young and keeps you kind of, you know, fresh and, and right. going. Yeah. And I think creating that safe space to welcome those types of conversations. If the space feels hostile, nobody's going to want to open up. So just your small example at the bank, obviously the teller felt comfortable sharing his experiences. Let's yep. see, we've got some other good questions. Let me... Um, I, I see a good one here. Can I jump on this one? Of course, please do. And again, it's because uh, I, I know him. This is Mr. Vancho from Windsor TFC, and I played yeah. for Vancho, the player. And, yeah. and uh, as an example, when this stuff happened, Vancho reached out and said, hey, I just want to have a, a conference call with you know three ex-alumni who are racialized people to get some advice. And again, simple as that's where it starts. So he's asking a very good, very good question here. How does this model now fit into coaching or into curriculums and certifications? And how does how do we get this diversity education into uh, into our our programming? And that's something I'm working on as well. I've had a number of conversations at at certain levels around uh, Canada soccer, around uh, you know individuals in in terms of positions of power. We have to make that change. I don't have the answer today, um, you know, and it's not up to me or one person. I think we need to start to look at this and not do it um, from a position of placating people or tokenism. We have to truly be inclusive. And we're seeing it as a first start. Um, you know, we're seeing that that start happen um, with um, uh, with the, the League One program that you guys were able to put in place for the uh, for the, the education and training for, for women in soccer. 
uh, putting through 50 something coaches that that's amazing it's a great okay. first start and you know i'm pretty sure you could talk a little bit more to that chelsea but that didn't come overnight you know that took no. time to put that together um how long was that six months or eight months of work it was and not even me there were so many people involved in that initiative from all walks of life yeah. helping move that change forward totally yeah there's definitely a need we're, we're seeing quite a few questions around resources and making Yes, uh, making resources available. So yes, we will do that. And that's something we have to do as a culture and as a community. And it's going to always be changing. Um, you know, as we said, uh, this didn't happen just overnight. It took a long time to get us where we're at. And it's going to take time to create those resources and find them. But the resources are out there uh, just for one to look. I mean, there's not a straight path to this. Um, you know, if you do the work uh, and, and start to really engage yourself in it, you, you'll, you'll find you can find the resources that are available. They're not in one strict course or program but you know it, it, it's there how i got my start in this whole area was i was actually a a, a full-time marketing person as i mentioned centennial and they offered this course uh, to employees and i took the course and in taking the course the um uh, the facilitator professor said you're really great at this stuff you should teach it and i said it's great if you if i'm if you think i could teach this you need to get me a job she said yeah. okay i'm gonna get you the job <laughs> there so you go the job no, no lie, uh, two, a year and a half, almost two years later, I was actually in Trinidad with my son training for the Trinidad national team. And I got a call saying, uh, can you come in for an interview? I'm like, interview for what? For, oh, that teaching thing, you know, Zabeda said you'd be really great. And uh, the, the chair of the department said, but I don't understand your resume that, you know, she, she had forwarded to me. It doesn't have much teaching experience on it, right? And I said, like, well, he doesn't have the exact examples. When I get back to Canada, I'll send, you know, on a more updated resume. So I did that. And then the, the, then the challenge was, well, you don't have an, a master's degree. Uh, I only hire people with master's. I don't know how we're going to look to hire you because you don't have the experience. And I said, well, I have life experiences, which more than makes up and speaks for that. Let me have just an interview. Give me an opportunity and chance to network with you. Don't even think it's an interview. I just want to network because I work at the college, you work at the college. Make a long story short, I had the interview. And by the time the interview was over, I was hired. Uh, so just working part time over, you know, over years, a few courses here or there. But anytime an opportunity has presented itself, as I said, racism works to deny you opportunity and deny you access. So wherever I find opportunity or access, I jump on it. So really quickly, um, what had happened was there was an opportunity a year, year and a half ago in the midst of COVID, uh, sorry, just before COVID, sorry, um, they were trying to run the same course in China. And everybody said, well, there's no possible way that we can teach social justice to the Chinese culture because it, the government will block certain things. It's not allowed. You can't, you don't have full freedom of speech. And I said, well, give me a try. I want to do it. So really, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come up with some ideas and we'll go ahead and see how it is. So I put together a little bit of an idea, modified the curriculum, presented it to the chair. They went back and then they actually ended up having a whole delegation come across from China to uh, to Canada. And then I was able to teach that professor. Make a long story short, uh, you know, six months later, I was delivering a modified curriculum to uh, to China, to the Shizal campus. And now that program is up and running and it's a, it's a home run. But it started with the idea that, you know, I, I was going to step outside of my own comfort zone and do something that, you know, I was going to help engage some other people and some learning myself because I'm getting a chance to learn another culture, right? It's being open, right? Yeah. And saying yes. I think those are two things that as we get older, I'm not old. I wouldn't, I'm not proclaiming to be old, but as you get older, you tend to go back into comfort zone and don't want to expand. So um, I think that's great, Paul. There are so many questions and comments. Um, we'll do one more. So Paul, if there's one that you see that's jumped out at you that you want to address, sorry if you hear my dog, um, sure. huh. but go for it. Otherwise I'll pick one. It's totally sure. up to you. No, definitely. Uh, I have a few questions here that are, that are similar I'm seeing here. Um, you know, the, the goal is going to be for us to have more conversations and to continue to uh, to look at this. People are asking about, you know, what do we what do we do in terms of taking an approach to, to starting to have this because with all this information even just presented today can be definitely a bit overwhelming. And I stayed, you know, I struggled uh, for the past two weeks as to how deep to go and, you know, and, and how much to uh, to just present. I'm hoping that people found it just enough, but not too much, you know, um, so to speak. So the question now is, is what kind of approaches and what kind of conversations and how do we get involved? People, people want to be involved. So uh, can they be part of the subcommittee? Well, you don't need to necessarily be part of the subcommittee for Ontario soccer. We can start looking at making subcommittees within our, our own communities and clubs as well too. And then working with the districts and or the clubs locally and or having presentations and having guest speakers. We've seen a lot of collaboration and really great work um, on return to play, on webinars, because we're all kind of, like I said, once again at home uh, with lots of time in our hands, uh, you know, but, spo but specifically focused in the area of training and drills and analyzing the game. But now I'm, I'm saying there's an opportunity for us to put those same resources because for sure, again, this is just by my own measure. I think we still got another five, six months before we're really, you know, out there in, in full capacity 
uh, you know, back to kind of normal. I mean, we're definitely expecting to get back to things in this summer very soon for the initial stages. But, you know, overall being back to a regular, what we, we know is what we see from before, it's towards the end of the year, maybe into next year. So we have some time basically to start to implement these things as we get back on the field within the next month, um, you know, to be able to uh, have these conversations within our groups, have these conversations within our clubs, and then uh, look to see how we can align um, ourselves with uh, with the, our club and then also with the district. So there's lots of work to be done and uh, people are asking how could they can get involved and that's a really a great sign. I think that uh, how we get involved is by um, trying to work, um, you know, in, in, in connection with one another because the toughest part of all this is taking the first step and many have done that today by being here on this call. Um, it's great to see we still have close to 45 to 50 people still on this call. Um, so it just shows that uh, people are actually engaged and wanting to to have more of this meaningful discussion in society. Um, so what I would suggest to Ontario Soccer is, hey, let's do it again, even maybe with a little bit bigger panel to even. I know that was initially kind of the plan, but things didn't come off the way we wanted to. But this can definitely fall into the purview of the, the new diversity officer and the diversity subcommittee. And we can continue to have these kinds of conversations as an ongoing basis, maybe even uh, park it as something whereby it could be maybe something that is, um, you know, uh, maybe even every every other month or something. I know resources and time and money go into these things, but I think it's a worthwhile endeavor if we as a community are willing to engage and we have enough people who are willing to have the conversations that we can start to make meaningful change as a society. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so to close things off, let me just first and foremost, thank you again, Paul, for your time and for such a impactful um, conversation and presentation. I would imagine that everybody on the call maybe had some their eyes opened a little bit, learned something and can take something away from today's presentation. Um, I, I also hope that it's you know, charting maybe a course towards a greater inclusion, access and opportunity for all as we uh, find new ways towards fostering diversity while we get ready to return to play. It's very exciting. Hopefully we get to return to play soon. Um, to end this week's session on a high note, I'm also delighted to let you know that we are driven, We See that you're driven by your though those positive survey results and Ontario Soccer has decided to extend the play on e-learning series until the end of May. Uh, you can join me on May 6 at 1 p.m. I'll welcome my dear colleague, Dr. Tracy, um, for the sequel to her tremendous webinar on resilience and mental health in young athletes with more insights and answers to your questions. Registration details will be shared with you shortly. Stay well, stay safe, and let's continue to pitch in and play on. Great stuff. See you guys all up Thank there you. or in the next webinar series. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Paul. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now.